Hey dudes, welcome to the Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming one of the screenwriters of the 1978 cult classic Attack of the Killer Tomatoes and all of its sequels, Costa Dillon. I'm having Costa on the show today to talk about how this strange cult classic movie came to be. What was, you know, the inspiration behind it, you know, uh, the filming process, the casting, and how all the sequels got made, and if there's going to be any more in the future. And I can't wait. This is going to be awesome. Week four of Halloween October on Splat from the Past begins now. And I am so friggin' excited. So yeah, here is my interview with Costa Dillon. Hey, Costa. Hi, Tommy. <laughs> Welcome to the show. How are you? Okay. Oh, great. It's such an honor. Thank you for taking the time this morning. Sure. Uh, so... Going back in time, uh, did you like movies early on? Okay, so... <laughs> all right. I, I, I never had that question before. Let me think about this. Yeah. Um, my mother was a movie fan, and she taught me to like movies. Um, uh, I, I was amazed that she could... We, they'd show a picture of somebody like Humphrey Bogart. She would say, Humphrey Bogart. And I'd say, wow, you know who that actual person is? Um, and so I, I learned to like movies uh, through her, I mm-hmm. think. Uh, and then, um, uh, you know, discovered the, the classics, really, um, uh, as well as the contemporaries when I was a teenager. But I, I really started in my teens watching the, the classic films. Uh huh. Can you remember the very first movie you saw? Oh no, I was probably four or five. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I can remember going to the movie theaters when I was young, seeing um, I think Three Hundred Spartans, the original, um, at the movie theater, and um, Disney films. Uh, I can remember seeing Fantasia re-release in the sixties and things like that, but uh, I can't remember the actual first one. Mm hmm. Do you have do you have like a list of uh, your favorite movies of all time? Uh, yeah, but it's pretty long, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I I can't do it. I, I I can't do a what's your favorite movie kind of thing. I would probably start listing ten or fifty movies, and, and then I would turn into twenty or twenty five movies, and then those would keep getting longer. Yeah, <laughs> it's like different movies for different reasons. Yeah, I'm like that too because I'm a big movie buff. <laughs> Uh, did, did you like the uh, the low budget horror and sci fi movies that inspired Attack of the Killer Tomatoes? Well, yeah, I used to, you know I used to watch on Saturday afternoons back when TV was what uh, you watched because they put it on for you. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. and on Saturday afternoons they would show old movies, uh, mostly a lot of Japanese movies, Godzilla movies, and and uh, American classes like them and and so forth. And I like uh, I like those kind of monster movies, um, particularly like Ray Harryhausen's um, stop motion animation film. Uh, they they fascinated me. I did I do remember seeing Jack the Giant Killer at the movie theater. Now that I think about it, um, I was about uh, eleven or twelve or something. And um, that some of them were great, you know, for what they were. Um, you know, Godzilla was kind of big rubber suit, but Others were funny because they were just so unintentionally funny. That that was obviously the inspiration for the Killer Tomato movies was bad horror films that weren't supposed to be funny. So we got the idea of making one that was intentionally bad uh, to um, just kind of uh, homage uh, to those those movies. Yeah, the so bad it's good category. (laughs) That's what I like to think. (laughs) Yeah. Where are you from originally? Well, my dad was in the Marine Corps, so we moved around quite a bit, but since uh, seventh grade, I was in San Diego. Wow, wow. 
So how did you meet uh, John DiBello and Stephen Pierce? Peace. Peace. Uh, we were in, we were in uh, junior high and high school together. Junior high together. And high, yeah, we've known each other since around 1967. Wow. And so by the mid-70s, were you guys, like, uh, taking film classes or something? No. Um, we had... We well, don't have formal training in film. Uh, I have a degree in environmental planning. Steve has a degree in political science, and John has a degree in history. Um, we started making films in high school for fun. Um, mm-hmm. John, particularly, was kind of the lead person. He had been interested in film, and we had a Super 8 camera, and we just started making films uh, around 10th or 11th grade. Uh, that we would just uh, show to. Uh, around the neighborhood, or you know, the, uh, everybody in your high school class was in the movie, um, and uh, we're just doing it for fun. We grew that into a film company. Wow! It's so. You get, what was the uh, genesis behind um, attacking the killer tomatoes, and how you guys got the idea to choose tomatoes as the primary focus? I have. We have done a, a few other um, short films. And we did, um, all three of us, for one, for one semester, were at, uh, in college together, and we like, uh, woke up and went to different colleges. But mm-hmm. we had one film class. It was my one and only film class. <laughs> and um, I had earlier come up with the idea of moving to Japanese film because I had seen a film called Attack of the Mushroom People, right. which is a kind of a... Some people really like it. I highly regarded the Japanese horror film. I just thought it was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and I was watching it a Saturday afternoon, and I just thought, you know, what's even more ridiculous is being attacked by mushrooms. And for for reasons I can't explain, I have no ma- recollection. I don't know why I picked tomatoes. Um, I have no idea. Since then, I wish I'd picked something easier to make because tomatoes turned out to be a real challenge to, to build and uh, make six foot tomatoes. I wish I'd chosen zucchinis or something, but uh, <laughs> it it was it just popped into my head of why not killer tomatoes? Because I mean, immediately thought you know the silly things about being eaten by a BLT or something, um, and that was <laughs> I brought the idea to to my to John and Steve, and and uh, we made a little short film uh, for our, our college class, which you can see in um, the, the um, special edition. Um, set that Rhino and put out a few years ago, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, that was the um, beginning of what eventually became a feature film. Wow! All because of attacking the mushroom people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, because I always thought that tomatoes was a very interesting um, monster focus, you know, for the movie. Um, yeah, I didn't even realize about, about Attack of the Mushroom People because I discovered that movie much, much later in life. Mm-hmm. But, uh, People know it. It's, you know, that's a forgotten film, right? Yeah. <laughs> you guys used a 35 um, millimeter Kodak camera. Uh, what was the budget on the movie, and how was the the money funded? Well, um, I don't sure. We, we didn't use Kodak. I'm pretty sure we had a, 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 an Airy, but I'm not sure. Um, Kodak didn't make 35 millimeter cameras. Um, you had to have an Aeroflex or a Panavision or something. Um, yeah, I am. Um, we, we raise the we raise the money from people we knew, um, parents and other relatives and acquaintances and so forth. Um, uh, we formed a uh, you know an LLC and um, just raised the money from people we knew. Mm-hmm. And the, and the cast was all people you knew. Oh no, the Screen Actors Guild. Um, the all the all of the um, all four of the Killer Tomato movies, including the first one, are union films. They're all screen extra skills, except for the, under what's called the Taft Hartley Law, you can have up to 25% of your cast be non union. And uh, so we were, we were there, union actors. Yeah, the, f- the first one, I mean, has actors in it I never saw again and stuff. I don't even know if anyone in that movie is still left alive, although I heard that it was Dana Ashbrook's first movie. Yeah, Dan Asbrook is in that movie, and uh, so is um, um, 
Jason Cameron, who later became the drummer for Soundgarden, and uh, <laughs> I can't think. Uh, yeah, through Pant, he was the, the drummer for Pearl Jam. So uh, two people in there who went on the show business uh, careers. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, this is this is an IMDb quote, just like the uh, the, the Kodak um, camera thing was. Uh, all the uh, crew members non-union. The crew was not union. That's correct. Yeah. And I was, and uh, that the uh, the giant tomatoes were made of foam. Yeah, the making of giant tomatoes was a huge uh, undertaking because we couldn't figure out how to do it. We went through all the prop houses in Hollywood trying to find something that would work, and there was nothing that would work. Uh, we tried getting the giant balloons. That didn't work. We tried to make it out of paper mache. That didn't work. We tried building a framework out of PVC pipe and chicken wire. And uh, that didn't work. And uh, we were kind of um, um, stuck until um, there used to be a big company here called Roar Industries in San Diego. They built the, the park cars in, in San Francisco, and mm-hmm. they worked on a lot of um, aerospace projects. And they had they were building when they're building the park cars. They, um, that's the Bay Area Rapid Transit cars, they um, had a foam that they put inside the walls in order to um, reduce the noise of the cars. And it's, it's kind of a, um, a, and, a and B kind of thing. You put in one chemical, then you have the catalyst, and then it foams up and then hardens. You kind of see that stuff's not that unusual now. You, you can get it in a can and spray it in your own walls in your home. It's yeah. common now. But it wasn't common then. And a lot of our friends in that down here where we lived in San Diego, their, their parents worked at the uh, Roar Industries. And they told us somehow we figured that out. So we ended up digging these uh, semicircles in the ground and uh, building, you know, a half a circle with a foam and then gluing the two circles together. Uh, it, it made them pretty heavy. And uh, so uh, they, they would unfortunately have a, a, a rather short shelf life because if they rolled around too much, their own weight would cause them to um, to uh, cr- crush themselves, the, the big six-foot ones. So if you watch the end of the film in the stadium, which we filmed last on purpose, you know, mm-hmm. you know normally movies aren't shot in order. We didn't shoot in order, but we definitely shot the stadium scene in order because we knew that tomatoes probably wouldn't survive. The giant ones wouldn't survive that scene, and they didn't. They, yeah. uh, <laughs> they pretty much fell to pieces. Um, rolling down the, the ramp of the stadium, um, but they were they were really heavy. Um, it took a, a few people to carry them around and in and out of the trucks and stuff. Nowadays, there's so many more opportunities. Yeah. Um, I mean, including CGI. But I think even if we made it out, we wouldn't want CGI because CGI makes it look too good. I mean, it would defeat the purpose. I'm always amazed at people who tell me that they can tell those aren't real giant tomatoes, and I'm like, duh, really? You really? Like we had six foot tomatoes, it's, it's <laughs> a stunning revelation. It's like, <laughs> thanks, thanks for filling me in. <laughs> and a lot of Mothra wasn't real either, so uh, don't look for it. For a... Yeah, after, after the movie was over, did you guys uh, each individually keep the tomatoes, or did you dispose of all of them? No, they just they just they just disintegrated. Um, you know, they, by the time we ended the movie, they were a wreck. Um, I think we probably had a couple of the small ones we made, like the one that was the um, so-called cherry tomato, but I have no idea where it is now. That's 40 years ago. Yeah. Did you, did you guys have an estimated number of how many tomatoes you had? Well, we used to have what I called, because um, I was a production designer, I, I, we used to have uh, extra tomatoes and star tomatoes. Um, for star tomatoes, I would go to the, a grocery store and pick them out, um, you know, nice looking um, close up tomatoes. For the extras, the ones in the background, we'd go to, uh, I would go to the food distribution, uh, produce distribution place here in San Diego, which is now uh, totally gone. It's, it's uh, the gas lamp quarter, which is a fancy, fancy uh, food and drink area of San Diego now, but it was the produce distribution area, and they would just sell me their. Secondary, there's you know second um, stuff they didn't want to put in grocery stores, um, 
not, I mean, if there had been a producer here, it would have been the stuff that was made in a tomato sauce or something. But these were things that were originally sent for selling, but they had gotten the older, they weren't, they were blemished or whatever, and the company didn't want them, so they sold them to me cheap. Um, unfortunately, we didn't always, you know, film as we had hoped, because of something would go wrong or something get delayed. So there's nothing like the smell of a 30-gallon trash can full of rotting tomatoes. And to this day, I can recall that smell if I have to. It's, it's pretty horrible. Yeah. <laughs> I <laughs> bet. Was this one of those movies that uh, you had to shoot mostly on weekends? No, no. We shot in about four weeks. We shot six days a week. Um, but when you're using union actors, you can't do that. You, you know, the using a day player or a week player and the number of hours a day you can shoot is, is regulated when you have your lunch breaks so all that stuff is you can't once you find a screen actor skills contract is, um, there's a lot of technical um, uh, performance things you have to do per contract but then just from a money standpoint you, you can't uh, uh, keep calling your actors back it's, it's more expensive to pay them as a day player than it is as a week player right and, uh, did you mostly shoot it in San Diego? It's entirely filmed in San Diego, yeah. Entirely, yeah. Now, I've, I've interviewed a lot of uh, people from 70s landmark horror films, and a lot of them didn't have a good business sense and missed out on a lot of money because of the public domain or, you know, something happened business-wise um, after the movie hit at the box office. How did you guys avoid that? Well, we didn't. Um we lost money at the box office. Um, the film business was entirely different in 1978. It's nothing, nothing like it now because of all the platforms and everything. So making a film, in those days, our largest single expense was the film stock. Um, we shot on what was called um, 5247 or 5347. I can't remember. It's a Kodak negative film. Um, most low budget films were shot on positive film. We shot on negative film. And... Uh, which, which is one reason why the film looks good uh, to this day. But we, um, once we, we had a hard time getting distribution, and then when we got distribution, um, sometimes the cost of shipping the film itself would, would eat into the money we were going to make from the showing. And it was really... Um, um, uh, you know, mistakes. We made mistakes in the amount of money it cost us to uh, make the copies of the film and send them out and so forth because of the way contracts work and stuff. So, yeah, we learned the hard way and probably lost some money. But we had other people, <laughs> you, know, you know, some distributors lost money. We had a distributor in the South who picked our film over Star Wars. Um, <laughs> he was for, for showing in a theater and he lost out on the Star Wars contract. So, he, and not everybody makes the smartest decisions. Yeah, was post, was post production um, uh, even more expensive? No, well, you know, we there's a lot of we had a one of the reasons why this film is famous and holds up is because we put the money on the screen, so to speak. That is, we didn't pay ourselves a big salary and then scrimp on the film. We we actually hired a symphony orchestra and an original. Um, sound score, and most most of the time, a low budget movie, um, you know, was um, you know you get a guitar and a synthesizer and a drummer, and you have this waka waka music. It's cheapo stuff, or you use you use um, uh, uh, public domain records in those days. You could just buy a record that had a um, was already um, you, you bought the rights with the record, and you could use the music and so forth. So we actually had an original score mm -hmm. um, um, and an actual orchestra. We hired musicians and recorded the score in Hollywood at Glen Glen Sound. Um, and it, the, the two people composed it for us, uh, Gordon Goodwin and Paul Sunford. Um, Gordon Goodwin now is a... Uh, Emmy and Grammy winning um, composer, arranger, and he owns his own band, Gordon Goodwin's Big Fat Band. Um, and he's, he's become um, quite successful in the music business. Mm -hmm. he's a student, he was a student uh, in college when we hired him. Wow. 
Yeah, you guys broke him in. Yeah, so to speak. Uh, uh, it also helps that Gordon has a lot of talent. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he does. When, when did you guys know that the movie had reached a cult success? Oh, got for 10 years. Um, we, when we finished the film and you know, made a little money and so forth, we decided to do another movie. Um, a film called, uh, has various different names, um, Happy Hour or um, Sour Grapes, depending on, because the distributor changed the name of the movie. Mm-hmm. Rich Little and Jamie Farr, Connie Katain. Um, and uh, it didn't do very well, mostly because the, um, the, the company that we had contracted with for distribution kept demanding changes in the script to the point where it completely ruined the movie, in my opinion. It wasn't at all the movie we set out to make and, and so forth. And we were working on another film, which I've written a, a script for another comedy, really different topic. Mm-hmm. And um, we were about 19, the late, mid, mid 1980s. And on the TV show Bucket Babies, they had used a clip from Killer Tomatoes in a scene that um, I can't remember which character, Little Elmo or something. I think I remember so that. Yeah. Back. Well, it turned out that that became an incredibly popular episode of Bucket Babies which got uh, people interested in the film again. Um, also about that time, videotape began. And um, for a lot of people who might be listening to this, we're alive in those days. <laughs> um, when videotape first came out, the big motion picture companies would not release their films on video. They were afraid it would cut into their um, profits for, for uh, showing films on television. Mm-hmm. That was the only other outlet for a film to show it on TV or to show it in a movie theater. So they refused to release their films on video. Um, we said, heck yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and so we were on the first you know, few hundred titles that could come, that was released on videotape. And in those days, videotape was priced for rental. It, um, uh, Coach Mayo, saw, I think, sold for $110. Because, again, the major studios figured nobody would want to own a movie. Um, they would rent one, but they wouldn't want to own one. And so they, they, they were priced high for rental stores to buy, and then you would rent it. Mm-hmm. Um, they also didn't want to lose track of the film by, by having people buy it. But because we were available, and people were had these new VCRs and not a whole lot to see on them, that helped uh, create a whole new audience right there. And because of the success of Muppet Babies, um, we got the interest of more people in doing a sequel. So we were approached um, to do a sequel 10 years later. And we said basically, no, we've moved on from making um, tomato movies. We did one. That's that's all we ever planned to do. <laughs> then they you know, used the this super secret magic word to say, you know, we'll pay you. And we said, okay, we'll do it. Um, so that we did return of the killer tomatoes, but it was it was it wasn't until that time, almost ten years later, that we realized we had something going. And then, uh, almost about the same time, was the Harry and Michael Medved had done their um, worst movies of all time, their Golden Turkey Awards, they called it, mm-hmm. show in New York, and uh, put out a book called the Golden Turkey Awards. And they wanted to use our film and. We basically said, okay, but only if we win. Um, you know, we're either the, we, we either we win as worst vegetable movie of all time or we don't want to be in it. And they agreed. So, Killer Tomatoes won, the, you know, the quote, contest, unquote, of a worst vegetable movie of all time, of which Attack of the Russian people, I think, came in second. Um, and <laughs> uh, that also boosted the popularity of the film because of that festival and their book. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it, it probably became the one of the most played movies on Elvira's movie macabre. Yeah, and again, the reason is that, you know, we had, because we had spent the time and we spent the money to shoot it on negative film with a real orchestration, the film looked good. Most cheap movies in those times were shot on 16 millimeter, which looks terrible on TV. If you were to show it on HD now, it looks horrible. Um, 
Yeah. And if um, we shot it on positive film, uh, eventually all of the prints would look pretty bad. But because we shot it on negative film, we could strike new prints off the negative film that looked great. And so we had a, a high quality looking low budget movie. And that made a difference to the as well. Nice. Yeah, I mean, it reached Rocky Horror uh, uh, level of success, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, we weren't, we were 23 years old. We didn't know anything about making movies. We we had no history in the movie business, no relatives in the movie business, um, and so forth. We were figuring it out in the seat of our pants. Um, so, yeah, we made tons of mistakes. We didn't even have lawyers. But, you know, when you're 23, you do a lot of stuff because you want to, not because you're... You know, Steve Jobs, and you're really brilliant. You're just, you're just a 23-year-old saying, <laughs> "Hey, let's do this." <laughs> yeah. Did Did you guys decide to uh, cast John Aston in the sequels because you wanted big names in them? Yeah, we wanted to get uh, a name, um, and so we auditioned people. Uh, Ricardo Montalban thought it was it was too. He couldn't understand it. He he said he just didn't get. <laughs> get the plot, and I thought, I kept thinking, but you've got Wrath of Khan, it, you know, you, you get that, but you don't get this, um, <laughs> and uh, John did it, John was just great, I mean, not only did he, was he great in the role, but he was a heck of a nice guy, he was just, he just was fun to have, he was, he, he played it for all it was worth, um, he didn't take himself too seriously, I mean, the guy's been in a thousand movies, you know, from, from West Side Story, and on down, and he—he he was just—he uh, was just delightful, and um, yeah, we were really glad to have him. Mm-hmm. And you guys also had George Clooney in return. Yeah, George and Clooney and um, uh, Anthony Stark, <laughs> the real <laughs> Iron Man, Tony Stark, were the two. Both of them auditioned, just like with dozens of other actors um, and uh, and women for the woman's role. Um, era. And um, I, I didn't know who George was at the time he was on A Facts of Life, which was a TV show I never watched. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but I liked his uh, audition right away. I thought it was great. And um, so we hired him immediately as soon as we yeah, auditioned. And I think Tony pretty much just about the same time. Um, and of course, um, um, I'm not. I think George had an acting career after that. I haven't kept track, um, but I'm pretty sure he had. Yeah, he had a short-lived crime series. I remember. Yeah, yeah somewhere. He's been. I don't know what he does now. Yeah. <laughs> but did you did you think this guy is going to go somewhere? No, you don't think about that stuff. If I thought about that stuff, I would have stayed friends with him so I could go to his villa with Barack Obama and like Como in Italy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, was, I like working with George. He's a very decent guy, uh, very professional, and um, really um, easy to get to work with. Uh, Tony was more, more of a challenge in some ways. But mm-hmm. um, I, uh, his persona is, at that, was at that time, but it is now. Now, you can't, you can't forecast that kind of success. You know, mm-hmm. people laugh at the fact that he was in Return of the Killer Tomatoes or, you know, lots of other famous actors will go back and say, yeah, I was in that crummy film, um, whatever. And the thing is, almost every actor pays their dues. You, you, very few actors start in, you know, big budget movies. That's just, it's just um, rare that um, happens. It happens occasionally, but not that often. Most of them you know, while through plays and small films and TV commercials for years until they they um, are, quote, overnight successes. And so I don't apologize for that at all. You know, if it wasn't for some of these low-budget movies, some of these actors would never get their steps up. Yeah. I would think it's disingenuous of them to turn around and, and criticize these, these films because they were, they were getting to practice their acting, they were getting paid, um, they were building their resumes, and so forth. Um, you just don't, don't walk into, you know, Ben Hur is an unknown and get a lead role. It just didn't happen. It's very, it's, it's not that it yeah. never happens, but it's highly unusual. 
Mm -hmm. It's really sad, too. I mean, like, you know, Patricia Arquette does, doesn't like to talk about Nightmare on Elm Street 3, and she was great in that, and, you know, that was before she was successful. Yeah, and, like, you know, excuse me, but, <laughs> um, you know, you got you to gotta start somewhere, and, and these are the kinds of films that, where you start, because low budget films cannot afford to hire Matthew McConaughey, you know? Mm-hmm. In Strike Back, you guys had uh, John uh, Witherspoon. Was he making everybody laugh out loud? Yeah, I wasn't on that set very often, but he was uh, kind of a naturally funny guy. Yeah. Yeah, he's a funny guy. John Aston, though, he must have he must have told a lot of Adams Family stories. Yeah, John didn't talk a lot about his past. Um, he just wasn't that kind of guy. He wouldn't talk about Patty Duke. He wouldn't talk about. Uh, but to his past, if you asked him questions about something, um, like I asked him about working with um, um, Viva Max, uh, which I, this is a film I love, and um, things like that, uh, he would talk about it. Um, he, it both, of, both of his stepkids, Sean Aston and um, I can't think of his brother's name right now, we were on the set a couple of times as a nuisance, playing with squirt guns one day, I remember, and causing a great havoc everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, I think it just done Goonies. Um, but um, he he's just an unassuming guy. If you wanted to talk to him about him, you could, you know? The first day I met him, he came in for for makeup and stuff. Um, he's six foot tall, and I think he wore size six shoes. And I joked with him that, you know, how do you not fall over? Because that's not, not very much of a platform. Yeah. And even at that time, 1978 or 1987, John was pretty much bald. So one of the first things he asked me is, which hair do you want me to wear? And he had all these hair pieces in his briefcase. And <laughs> that was my introduction to John. And soon he was asking me, what, what, what hair do you want me to wear? <laughs> oh, so right away, I knew he was not going to be, you know, um, a, a problem. When we did... Uh, happy hour. Well, um, um, Jamie Barr was kind of, you know, he was a challenge at times. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rich Little was a challenge at times. And Tony Katane was a challenge all the time. Yeah. <laughs> but John was, John was never a challenge. He was like, great, you know, what, what do you want me to do? <laughs> I'm happy to be here. And life is good. Uh, he, was just, uh, he was just a delightful guy. Oh, that's great. Yeah, Killer Tomatoes Eat France is probably my favorite of the sequels. Did, did it offend anybody in France? It's my favorite too. Yeah. Did, did it, did it um, offend anybody in France? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we put that at the end of the film, um, Killer Tomatoes will return to Killer Tomatoes in France because they always had the thing at the end of James Bond saying, you know, James Bond will return and something. So we said, well, let's put that in there. And I put France because I'd never been to France. So I thought, let's go to France. Um, that's literally how we picked it. And so we had a title with no film. And um, once, once we realized that Fox was going to finance, you know, the film, we, we said, okay, <laughs> we, need to write a, we need to write a film to go with the title. And like all the other Killer Tomato movies, they're not really about Killer Tomatoes. They're, they're just satire or something else. So we decided to make fun of Americans' uh, stereotypes version of France. Um, we, we weren't intending to make fun of France or the French themselves. We were making fun of American stereotype view of France. And so if, if we offended any French people, I, I would certainly apologize, but we weren't directing it at them. We were directing what Americans um, seem to think of other places in the world. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like, it was in Jurassic Park where... Um, um, I can't, I can't, uh, I think of it, or Wayne Knight meets, meets the guy on the beach to, to give him the um, serum for the dinosaurs, and yeah. he says, I'll meet you in, in San Jose, um, and, you know, and he said, and they show him in this little beach hut in Costa Rica, and it's like, well, okay, A, San Jose is a huge city, <laughs> um, no. but, um, huge modern city, and B, it's nowhere near the coast. Um, because Americans' sense of other countries' geography is just awful, you know? <laughs> so that's what we were making fun of, is we probably think this is what France is actually like. So let's play with that. 
Uh, isn't it true you guys were originally going to make that the third one? Oh, I don't remember that. I don't remember that. Um, I mean, that's where the title was pasted, yes. But I don't. But like I said, the title was a spoof in the first place. So <laughs> um, I'm not sure we ever actually intended it to be. We didn't intend to do a third or fourth film until um, Fox uh, got interested in the cartoon show and then agreed to finance two more movies. So. Uh, and it wasn't as a matter of which one comes first. I think it was a matter of, okay, they need a movie now with right one, so we did Strike Back, which I think is a fairly weak uh, script for a lot of reasons. And then, uh, And what was it like working with Mark Price? Mark, Mark was easy to work with. Um, you know, it just come off of family ties. Um, he did not have much of a career, and after that, um, it kind of was his... His highlight was family ties. But he, again, he was very easy to work with. I mean, he's a young kid. He kept talking about how many houses we owned in Worcester. They're called, we can't even afford one house. And there's this 24 year old or whatever he was telling us, he said he's got three or four houses. Um, and uh, so forth. But he was very easy to work with. And Angela Bisser, who had just finished being Miss Universe, um, uh, this is really her only acting job. She had a couple of small other ones and then got married and quit working in the, in the business. I was also, you know, she wasn't, wasn't a great actress, <laughs> but, <laughs> but she did fine. She did fine. So, what, so why did you guys stop after this one? Uh, well, um, basically because, um, you know, ran its course. Um, John uh, did two other films, which were not, highly successful. You go on his IMDb, you can look him up. I can't remember the name of them. I was not involved. Um, uh, and since mm -hmm. then, he, John owns his own film business. He's been doing it regularly all along. This, is all, this became his career. He, he, his company makes uh, uh, films for the Navy. They do TV commercials, promotional videos, uh, things of this sort. Uh, they're quite successful. Uh, and uh, Steve was... Uh, state senator and uh, then the comptroller of the uh, state of California. And I was uh, out being a national park ranger and superintendent. And so we all had all gone on to um, other aspects of our life. Um, we didn't intend to to do it full time, um, largely because um, we didn't like people in the business. <laughs> yeah. um, there's a lot of unsavory people in the in the show business in Hollywood and are mostly interested in what can I get out of you and how can I use you with, to get what I want and so forth and it just they weren't, they weren't people I wanted to spend my life associated with it just didn't drive me yeah it's a, <laughs> I'm finding it out every day just how unsavory the business is you know <laughs> it's, uh, it's entirely based on uh, using other people for your gain. Um, you know, it, it, individual people, like I said, George is a nice guy, John Aspen's a nice guy, and I ran into other people, a lot of, lot of really great crew people. But um, there are also a lot of people whose entire world revolves around me, 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 and you're not worth anything to them unless you're, you can do something for them, make them money, make them powerful. Yep. I find that to be an attractive place to spend my life. Yep. Somebody once said it's called show business, not show friendship. Yeah, well, that's, that's true. Yeah. It is a business. It's the reason why they call it the film industry. Uh, uh, you can talk art all you want, but uh, it's a business. Yeah. So do you guys ever plan on making a reboot? on one right now. Nice, nice. It, anything um, get off the ground so far? Uh, too early to say. But too we early. have some things going on. Uh, but it is going to happen. Well, I hope so. Yeah, that would be great just to see, you know, where it would be now in the 21st century and CGI and all that stuff. <laughs> well, again, we want to be careful. Um, you know, as we, we don't want to make, quote, a real movie, because then you, um, 
you, you lose. It's really, you know, lightning struck for us. Um, and you, you, movies, I believe that movies find their audience, right. um, particularly comedies, because a drama tends to be a universal. What makes one person cry tends to make somebody else cry, right. and so forth. But for comedy, either you think it's stupid, or you don't get it, or you think it's funny. Two out of three is bad. Um, and so um, when I first started doing films, you know, I've done five feature films now, that, and you see the critics' reviews, and after a while, you just feel like, who cares? You know, um, John J. Osborne, the guy who wrote uh, Paper Chase, said uh, asking a writer what he thinks of critics is like asking a lamppost where he thinks of dogs. And it's a great um, thing to remember is that um, no matter what you do, nobody, somebody's not going to like your movie. It doesn't matter what it is. You can go in and it's the greatest films ever made. You're going to find people that like them. Um, mm -hmm. So you you have your audience for your film, and, you, and the trick is to not ruin it. I mean, we're already in the discussion that if we do another film, we got to make sure we don't want anything higher than a PG-13 because kids like our movies. Yep. And it became a cartoon show and so forth. We, we had a lot of pressure to make R-rated films and uh, make the third or fourth movie R-rated. And we said, no, we wouldn't do it. Actually, the second film R-rated. We shot a couple of R-rated scenes for Return of the Killer Tomatoes, and then we fought with uh, the um, distribution company that we didn't want them used. They made us shoot them, um, but we didn't want them because we thought it would kill our audience. Uh, for kids, and so that's still what we consider to be our our spot. Is we don't want anything that's beyond PG-13. Even though, let's say, right now, R-rated gross-out comedies are what make money. There's no, I mean, right. Rogan and all these guys, they make all these uh, hard R movies for um, language and sex and so forth that... Um, make them R-rated films. And I'm not going to say they're not funny. Some of them are cheap funny. I think bathroom humor is is uh, no challenge whatsoever. Um, and most sexual humor is of no challenge whatsoever. So it doesn't require you to be particularly clever or witty. It's just, you know, throw it out there and wait for the 17-year-old boys to laugh. That's not the kind of stuff I wanted to do. Um, I like the idea that we were a little more to it. You know, one of my favorite mm -hmm. lines in... Killer Tomatoes Eat France is when, when Gang Green says, we got to stop them here at the McEnroe line, and you see the guys with the tennis rackets and the tomatoes in France. Okay, if you're not a student of history to know what the Maginot line was, um, you won't get the joke about the McEnroe line. But if you're a kid, you couldn't care less. What you see is a bunch of guys hitting tomatoes with tennis rackets and wearing World War One uniforms. Yeah. It's just visually funny. So... So it's a joke on two levels. For people who get the joke about the Maginot line, it's funny. For people who don't, it just looks funny because you're six-year-old watching guys hitting tomatoes with tennis rackets and wearing World War One Army uniforms. That's the kind of thing we aim for. Is it everybody's kind of humor? Nope. A lot of people will consider it to be sophomore humor. That's okay. <laughs> you know what? I like Woody Allen's original film. Woody Allen doesn't like them. He says that doing comedies is like, and sitting at the children's table for directors. I disagree. I think Bananas and Sleeper and Take the Money and Run are hilarious films, and they yeah. have a big influence on me. And I think it's regrettable that Woody Allen disparages his own work. What's wrong with making people laugh? <laughs> yeah. If they think it's funny, give them something to laugh at. I'm not, you know, I'm not team server. I'm not going to pretend to be, but if it's something people laugh at, great. Yeah, those early Woody Allen movies are the best of, of all his movies, I think. Yeah, I can mind, if I watch Sleeper now, I still think it's hilarious. Mm-hmm, Sleeper, love that movie. But I'm, I'm glad that um, you guys are going to uh, do a new one, and I hope um, it comes. And I hope it gets made and comes out and stuff. And when it does, you can come back on and we can talk about it. Sure. And stuff. But yeah, I, 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 I do think that um, an R-rated Killer Tomatoes is not necessary. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to happen. Good, good. 
Well, Costa, thank you so much for coming on. I'm glad we uh, had this conversation about the empire that you created, which is Killer Tomatoes. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's, a small, it's a small empire. It's near Fredonia. Yeah. <laughs> and if, you know, if your listeners know where Fredonia is, good for them. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have yourself a great day, sir. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Costa Dillon. Ain't he a cool dude? I got glad that I got to have a conversation about the world of Killer Tomatoes. By far the strangest movie and franchise ever created, and I love it. I'm glad there's going to be a new one. That will be at least PG-13, not R. Um, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.